And now, more sports and torts with David Spada and Elliot Harris. Elliot, our next guest, I wasn't that familiar with him when I was looking at the NFL Hall of Famers, but after reading his bio, he was one of the top offensive linemen in the 60s and early 70s with the Eagles and Oakland Raiders. I remember him well. Let's get right to our next guest, Bob Boomer Brown. How did you get the nickname the Boomer? You know, when I was playing for the Eagles, a defensive back friend of mine, Joe Scarpetti, started calling me that um, our rookie year. And, um, you know, I was very, very attack-oriented. So it just kind of stuck, and um, I tried to beat the boomer all the time, week in and week out. Now, you're from Cleveland. How does, how does Woody Hayes not get you at Ohio State? How do you end up at Nebraska? Well, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's a very interesting story. Really, I, I wasn't really recruited by Ohio State. Um, you know, I, I talked to Nebraska, and I just liked how they talked to me in terms of an opportunity to play. I was not from a great high school program in Cleveland, uh, in Cleveland East Tech, and, um, you know, it, it just was a real good fit for me. I felt comfortable after talking with the freshman coach out there, and uh, so I took a shot. Who are your teammates on Nebraska? Any other future NFL uh, players? Uh, let me see. Who else play? Oh, geez, Lloyd Voss. Played with me. Um, I think he. I think he went to Pittsburgh. Uh, Larry Kramer. Um, geez, who else? Uh, Dennis Claridge. Geez, you know, boy, you're taking me back. I'm having a senior moment here. <laughs> this getting old thing is not cute, gentlemen. But it's the only game in town. Yeah. Well, Bob Devaney was the coach back then. Yes. What was he like to play for? Just a, a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, you know, sometimes I think that uh, people, are, well, people who are too young don't remember the 60s, and a lot of people forget about the 60s and the transition that the country was going through. And um, I couldn't have had a better coach to work for with a guy whose door was always open. There were a lot of social issues going on, as you know, in the country. And um, he was just a, a top-flight coach. Um, uh, and maybe even a better human being. He was just a wonderful, wonderful man. And then you get drafted by the Eagles with the second pick in that 64 draft, and that draft was loaded with future Hall of Famers yourself, Charlie Taylor, Carl Eller, Paul Warfield, Mel Renfro, Paul Krause. Could have had a nice right. team if you put all those guys together. Uh, absolutely. You know, um, I, I think I was talking to Charlie Taylor, and he said, you know, the 64 class was quite a class. And and, and I told him, boy, you're absolutely right. Uh, there were a lot of very talented guys that came out. Um, you know, the reason why, I have no idea. But um, it, it was a fabulous, fabulous class of guys. What was it like going from the cornfields of Nebraska mm-hmm. to Philadelphia? Well, yeah. You know, both places I was treated great. Um, of course, Philadelphia fans are unique in the sense that they not only love their football, but they know the game. And um, I tell you what, I played five years in Philadelphia and was never booed. And that's, I don't think many guys could say that. Uh, the fans were knowledgeable. Um, they're very, they could be critical. But if you gave them what they expected to see when they paid their money, um, they were they were great fans. When you were with the Eagles, was there a lot of racial tensions in Philadelphia back then, or was it kind of lightened up a little? Well, you know, it, you know, to be honest, you know, of course, I played on teams with guys who had played in form the Southeast Southwest Conference, and I'm sure at no time and during their careers as young guys and uh, or college had ever played with or against any. Um, athletes of color. So, I mean, you know, there there were there were things that were said and um, that that I would that I would consider and and people would consider inappropriate. Um, it it was not a great time um, to play on any team. I, I would imagine in the NFL, especially a team that was integrated and you had some fellows who had never played in an integrated environment. As a rookie, you win the NFL Rookie of the Year coming into the league. Was was that your anticipation that it would be that easy? 
Well, you know what? To be honest, I did not. I was not the rookie of the year in the National Football League. Uh, I was disappointed because I didn't make the Pro Bowl my rookie year. And um, you know, I've always, I've always been a hard worker, um, and 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 I was fanatically committed to doing well in the National Football League. And so, you know, I don't know where that information comes from, but you know, I was not Rookie of the Year. I don't know who was in the National Football League, but I certainly know it wasn't me. Did it help having Jim Ringo as a center on your team as a teammate? Yeah, you know, Jim was, um, I don't know how many years he had played at Green Bay, but he, he was really a very steady force. Uh, uh, you know, he made the offensive calls as a center. He had always had, he was not a big guy, if you remember, and, uh, but, but had great technique and was extremely quick. And um, was just, a, again, a, you know, a, a great teammate and a great center and a great Hall of Famer. Being from Cleveland, was there a part of you that says, you know, I wish the Browns could have drafted me? Because they had a pretty good running back back in the day in the <laughs> Brown there. You better know it. Um, <laughs> no, you know, I was, um, it, it, it's an interesting story. Um, when I was told that I was drafted, I think I was the second guy picked in the National Football League. And I think I was the first guy picked in the old AFL. And, you know, I, I took the NFL because at that time I thought it was the best football in the world. And I didn't want to be my age now, 70, and look back and ask myself, did I go AFL because I didn't think I could dance at the big dance? But as far as being a Cleveland Brown, it was a lot of fun, of course, playing in Cleveland when I was with the Eagles because I would look up in the stands and I'd have a lot of friends who were sitting in the bleachers and yelling at me, people that I, you know, played against in high school and some people I went to high school with, and they were actually there and, you know, watching me perform. And I thought that was really a, a big thing for a young guy. You were big into weightlifting when basically it was frowned upon in sports. How did you get into weightlifting? Well, you know, Nebraska was always a very innovative uh, place. And, um, you know, we had a we had a weight room, not a large one, but we did have weights. Uh, there were guys who, who were into lifting. And so, uh, you know, I started lifting out there. And matter of fact, I just finished my, my weight program for today. I do it to this day. It's, it's one of those things that's a part of my DNA now. Um, I knew that it made a difference. I felt that a lot of guys around the National Football League weren't lifting, and so it put me one up on them. Uh, it did not affect my quickness or my speed, and, you know, and I think that that's being proven more and more today because most programs, probably all the programs, Division One, A, whatever, have weightlifting programs. So, you know, I was lucky. I was not an innovator, but I was a guy who got on board and stayed on board. Now, you didn't block for Jim Brown, but you did block for Timmy Brown. Yeah. What, what sort of uh, player was he? You know, he was, Timmy was, you know, was the, the quintessential uh, turn-the-corner type of uh, halfback. Uh, we used to run a play in Philadelphia, the 21 flip, and... Uh, you know, you know, I, I like to think that he liked for me to lead it, and I, I know that I like for him to be back behind me. And uh, it, it was a great, it, it was a great play, and, and and we got a lot of mileage out of it. I did, however, have an opportunity to play with Jimmy, and uh, a couple of Pro Bowls that I went to. And then you go to the Rams in '69. Then it'd be fun going to the West Coast. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it it was different in the sense that. Back in those days, everyone thought that the best football in the world was in the old bumps and bruises division and the Western division of the NFL. So um, without getting into a long story about why I ended up being traded to the Rams, you know, on the other side of the world, um, you know, to me it was all football. It didn't matter, of course. The great part about that is I had an opportunity to work every day against that, that the best defensive end ever, and David Jones, Deacon Jones, and um, uh, to work against a guy like Merlin Olson and Roger Brown and Lamar Lundy. So you know it 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 only helped me to put me in a situation where I was working against just the very best lineman anywhere, and hopefully because we used to have some battles in practice. 
that was when one on one was a part of the daily routine and and it was always a, a challenge and it was you know it was always a good street fight did George Allen let the starters go against each other because a lot of coaches would have the starters go against the second team well you know George um, <laughs> you know he he would you know his first line guys he would let us occasionally mix it up a little bit but basically George was was you know just a defensive genius I believe he could design a defense to stop anything they're running today but uh, George uh, he had a leaning towards the defensive guys uh, you know if there was water on the field he made sure that they quenched their thirst first so the offensive guys we had to push our way to the front of the line did you regard yourself as a better pass blocker or running blocker? I, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, I'd like to feel like I could do both well. You know, I, I've always felt like you know anything that was born from a woman, I could block. So, you know, short of being a transformer, I didn't care. You know, it didn't matter if you called a thirty-four buck or you know, uh, you know, or pass route. It didn't matter to me one way or another. I didn't have a preference. You know, I was there to work, and uh, I was going to punch you in, and I was going to go to work. Deacon Jones, we interviewed a couple years ago, and he's not bashed, but he'll tell you he was the best defensive end ever. Would you agree with that? Man, I couldn't dispute it. You know, I've, I've played against some, you know, I, you know, when you think about, I, I came, I played during an era when, you know, I saw Carl Eller. Ooh. I saw Deacon Jones. Double who. I saw Claude Humphrey, <laughs> you know, I saw L.C. Greenwood. I mean, it was week in and week out. There was always a lot of talent out there. Bob so Lilly. Bob Lilly wasn't too shabby either. Who was that? Bob Lilly. <laughs> Better know it. Yeah, he was He was like a cat. And, you know, you know, when I, when, you know, he was playing defensive tackle more more so than defensive end. So, you know, I didn't have that many experiences against Bob, you know, blocking down. But, again, you know, his record speaks for itself. Um, but but he was not playing defensive end when I was around. Did you have a favorite quarterback that you like to block for, a guy who could get rid of the ball quickly and stuff like that? Well, you know, yeah, in Philadelphia was Norman Sneed and King Hill. And um, we never had a lot of great success, you know, as far as, you know, you hear these little terms, quick release, I, you know, what do I know? You know, I'm blocking a guy, so I'm going to stay on him as long as I can. Um, you know, Todd Kenny Stabler was just, 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 you know, the thing that made Kenny so, so great is that he never complained. I'm telling you, he never complained. He did not need, you know, if somebody brushed him or touched him or was in his face, Never a word, never a word. And the one thing about Kenny is that if you're down by three and it's a minute and 37 seconds to go, um, and and this is contrary to whatever I've, everything I believe, I've never believed that I needed a quarterback to be a leader. You know, we were all out there. We're getting paid. We're all professionals. And and boy, one day call me and let's talk about my my theory on leaders. And why guys are leaders or feel like they need a leader? Jesus Christ! How are you going to be a professional? But Kenny never complained. So if, if somebody touched him, he never said, "Oh man, you get these guys off me." All he said is, "Don't worry about it. We're going to win it." And then you go to the Raiders. It seemed like you kept going up and tail. You go from the Eagles to the Rams with the, all those future Hall of Famers like Rowan Olsen, Deacon Jones, and then the Raiders. I mean, they were loaded. You had Blitnikoff and Willie Brown and Ryan Mix. It had to be a dream come true for you. Oh, it, it, it was, you know, and, and 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 even to be more specific, I played on the line alongside um, Art Shell, Hall of Famer, Gene Upshaw, Hall of Famer, Jim Otto, Hall of Famer, George Bueller, great guard, and myself. So. You know, I I don't know how many teams, how many guys can say that they played on a line that had, you know, four All of Famers at the same time. I I don't know if that's ever been done. Did you have much interaction with uh, the owner, Al Davis? You know, no, not really, no. What was he like? What have you heard? (laughs) 
from what I heard from former Raider players is once you're a Raider, you are a Raider for life and he took care of his former players. That's what I've heard too. You know, I you know, I think that the one great thing about Al is that you always knew where you were. If he liked you, I honestly believed that, you know, he would go to the wall for you. And uh, you know, if you didn't necessarily have a relationship with him, um, you know, then that's just how that was too. I was surprised when I saw Marcus Allen back there because I know him and Marcus Allen had a lot of issues when he left the Raiders. You know, um, there, there was a little um, clip it in the snippet. I'm sorry, in the newspaper showing Marcus lighting a, a, um, a some type of you know eternal torch. And um, you know, as we get older, you, I guess you know if you have a, a beef with a guy, you need to let it go. I have no idea what that was about because I was not on the team when Marcus was playing there. So what I know is whatever you would tell me at this point. What was it like to play for John Madden? The best, the best experience I've had is as a pro football player. Great, you know, just he, he's everything he appears to be. He's, he's, he's nice. He's honorable. He's funny. He, he knows he knows when to get serious. Um, he has great expectations of his players, and he's the kind of a guy that you want to give your best for. Uh, not only just because you're being paid to do that, but he's just a really nice, nice man, nice guy. Was he like he was on TV as a coach, or is that a different persona he developed? Uh, you know, that's that's pretty close to Josh. Yeah, just just a, just a funny guy. You know, really, it was a very relaxed experience for me. Um, at, at Philadelphia, of course, I, I had great admiration and respect for Joe Harris. He was my first coach, and um, uh, George Allen, of course, was you know the Ram experience was a was a different sort of experience. But I would have to say that my Raider experience with John Madden, he made it just a great, great experience along with the guys. I mean, the Raider guys at one time, and maybe even today, I, I don't go around. But I mean, they were just a bunch of wild and crazy guys. It was a lot of fun in the locker room. Uh, we expected a lot of each other, and, and we tried to, to truly be a band of brothers. Did you work out a lot with Ryan Mix when you went to Raiders? Because no, Ryan was another guy who loved to lift. Yeah, Ron's great lifter. Great tackle. Great tackle. Great technique. Great technique. You know, um, when, when I was, but yes, we worked out, and, and the Raiders did not have the extensive weight room that they have now. Either all of this, you know, the weight thing was really, when I started in Nebraska, was not even in its infancy. You know, we were just one of the few schools that probably was doing it. And the Raiders did not have an exceptional weight facility at all. But I've always had Olympic weights here at the house. How did you know when it was time to call it a career? Uh, because the, the Raiders and, and didn't allow me into camp, and so they kind of helped me get there. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's just real. Got to keep it real. No, you're exactly right. And your son is a very successful, I see, attorney out there in L.A. Uh, my son is a genius. My son is, is, you know, he's the pride of my life. Um, he's a nice guy. He's a, he's a great attorney. Uh, did you see his um, the introduction, the introductory speech that he, he made for me to introduce me to the Hall of Fame? I did see it. It was absolutely incredible. That had to make, make you so proud. Let me tell you, you know, uh, the guys always have a bet as to who will be the first guy to cry. And, uh, you know, you got to think about income tax, bite your lip, you know, <laughs> something bad that you know i had to at least because it was such a touching moment for me and um to be honest you know i thought that i would have been in the hall of fame sooner i'm being very honest but you know it, it wouldn't have been nearly as sweet as it was to have my son as an adult introduce me this was this was the pinnacle of everything that, that added up from Cleveland East Tech to the University of Nebraska, Eagles, Rams, and Raiders. I mean, what else could I ask for? This was everything. Mr. Rick, you got inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame in 93. Mm -hmm. And Pro Football Hall of Fame didn't come until 2004. Were there times between then that you said, 
you know, I, I think I belong in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, but it, it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Uh, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. In all honesty, my Hall of Fame was every game I played, every player I played against, I, I just wanted to be able to do it in a way so when it was over that I felt that I worked hard enough and did enough to be in, but I wanted them to say, man, Bob Brown's getting robbed. And that's, at the end of the day, that's what it was all about to me, to be able to do it in a way so that when I was in high school, Willie Davis, a great defensive end from the Green Bay Packers, at that time was playing with the Cleveland Browns. And I'll never forget, I was a high school student as I was, and I was at Garfield Park, and I was just watching some of the Browns work out before the season. And he called me over, and we talked about grambling. And I was just watching. He said, well, let me show you some things. And I think that was a fabulous turning point for me because when I had an opportunity to play against Willie in Green Bay and had a chance to talk to him before the game, that was a very exciting thing for me to be able to see someone who was kind to me, nice to me, and trying to introduce me to some techniques that later during the course of the game. He said, I didn't teach you that. I said, well, I had to pick up a few things along the way. But that, that was a great moment for me. I don't think you see so, in today's NFL like the players helping the younger players like they used to. It seemed when you go to the Hall of Fame, I went there this year for the first time. It seemed yeah. like that the players from the '50s, '60s, '70s truly enjoyed playing against each other, were friends, and basically to this day are still friends. Well, you know, may or may not be the case. You know, I'm thinking that, you know, maybe when millionaires get together, you know, they're mad. I don't know. You know, uh, we didn't make a lot of money. And uh, But that's not to say that these guys don't play as hard and, and don't deserve a, the piece of the pie that they're getting. I, I don't know. You know, I just don't want to be one of these old guys who, who says that, oh, it was better when I was doing it. You know, it's, it's a great game. Uh, we've passed the, the baton on to some great young players, and they might not be quite like us because the environment that, that they're dealing in and isn't like it was when I was a young guy coming up. But it's still a great game, and I, I, I think that we handed, over to, handed it off to some great young guys. Well, what's it like for you, who somebody played when Nebraska was in the Big Eight, mm -hmm. and now have Nebraska in the, in the Big Ten? I, I just, it, just makes, I, it makes no sense to me. <laughs> well, you know, I, it's really interesting because when I heard that it was going to happen, I, you know, it, it didn't. I'm like you, you know, it, you know, it was the old Big Eight and it was a great conference, and you know, our big game every year was against Oklahoma, and um, you know, and but but on the other hand, when I started looking at things from a geographical point of view, you know, we, we're right next to Iowa, and you know. You know, from, from from a business point of view, maybe it would be better, a lot cheaper, you know, to travel just as cheap to go to Iowa and Ohio State, uh, uh, Illinois in the Big Ten. And, you know, I, I think Nebraska is a great school. Um, I still sweat whenever they play. I, you know, I'm not much into watching the pro game, but I do watch the college game. And, um, again, as an old timer, I just don't want to be one of these old duffers. Well, it'll never be like the Big Eight. Well, it's not the Big Eight. It's the Big Ten. I still root for them. It's still my alma mater. They were nice to me. You know, they've paid a lot of tributes to me. My number, my jersey is retired out there. Elliot, the Bears could use a guy like Bob Boomer Brown on their offensive line right now. Well, he might be a little old, but he probably could do better than some of the guys they have. The Bears could use a receiver kind of like our next guest, James Lofton. I think uh, he may have slowed down a bit, but he's still got the good hands. We're going to take a short break, and when we get come back, we'll be on with James Lofton. Stay tuned. 